You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket Podcast, a podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. We are recording this episode after the conclusion of the first test match played between India and South Africa at Wysag. Let me welcome my co-host Ajit so we can talk about this and a lot of other things as well. Hello Ajit. How is it going for you? Hi Giri. Things are going good for me. How are you doing? Not so bad myself. Uh, I'm still recovering from the finger injury, uh, injury that I sustained almost a month ago now. Uh, I guess it takes another couple of weeks after which uh, hopefully I can play again. But then again, I think it's uh, uh, it's almost winter over here and then uh, there's not much cricket to be played outside anyway. So Indeed. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, the finger heals nicely. Well, at least uh, it does not impede you for your everyday other tasks, right? No, it might uh, when it comes to winter, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you can also play a bit of indoor cricket maybe in the upcoming months. But uh, yeah, it's a pity indeed that, you know, you have to break it the first time you played it after a while. That was yeah. a bit unfortunate. Mm. Right. So uh, maybe you want to start us off with the India-South Africa match, Giri. Yeah, let's do that. So the first test match between India and South Africa uh, in this series, in this home series in India, was played at Wysag or Vishakhapatnam. Um, as it happens, India won the toss uh, and they decided to bat first. Um, Rohit Sharma making a debut, uh, this time as an opener. Uh, and along with Mayank Agarwal, both of them scored big centuries. Rohit scored 176 and Mayank 215. And India ended up making a huge 502 for seven, declared. Um, South Africa then... Um, you know, they, they batted well, although they lost a few wickets at the top of the order. They batted well as thanks to uh, uh, a big century by Dean Elgar, 160 runs and uh, good contributions in the lower middle order from Puck to Plessy with a 50 and then Quinton de Kock making a counter-attacking uh, century there. Thanks to those innings, they managed to, you know, score 431 runs, which is not so bad comparing with uh, India's 502. India in the second innings ensured that they extended the lead. Uh, Rohit Sharma scored a century again, uh, supported by Pujara with 80, 80 plus runs. And then with some quick fire runs down the order by Jadeja, Kohli and Rahane, India managed to score 323 for four, uh, at which they declared. Um, South Africa was set a target of 395 runs uh, with, I think I would say, the last day's play remaining. Um and unfortunately, they were not able to come up with a the goods. Uh, they lost wickets far too quickly and uh, at regular intervals as well. Apart from uh, the debutant, uh, Senuran Muthusamy and Dane Pete at the bottom of the order, nobody else did a good job for them with the bat. And then they were all out for 191 runs. India winning the match comfortably. Uh, and I think they won by 203 runs. India take the lead. In this test series, um, so yeah, so one zero to India, and I think they stand at uh, one hundred and sixty points. I need to look that up, but uh, so they are top of the table in the ICC Test Championship. Yeah, they do. They do indeed have one hundred and sixty points. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look uh, when we look at some of the interesting talking points as far as India are concerned, right? Or for that matter, for that matter, the whole match, right? So. First of all is, of course, Rohit Sharma's elevation and him making a big turn in the very first innings of being elevated, right? And also making a double turn. So it is a first time in the history, I read somewhere, where a opener who, let's say, started opening, not debuting, but started opening, made two hundreds in the same match. This is the first time in the history of Test cricket, right? So that's a very good thing as far as Rohit Sharma is concerned. Also, he, I think he answered the questions whether he can open the batting very effectively. It still remains to be seen whether he can do equally well going outside, right? Giri? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, he has the technique. Of course, he opens in the limited overs format. Uh, and he did well in the World Cup as well uh, in England. So why not? I mean, I think he has the potential and he's now more experienced. 
he isn't he 32 now i think mm-hmm. he's 32 years old and with the wealth of yes. experience that he has and uh, also i think the maturity that he's showing now it's far better than what he was uh, back when he burst mm-hmm. out into the international scene uh, after that yeah i think that was 2007 world cup i remember him from that uh, 2007 t20 world cup in fact where he made his international mm-hmm. uh, debut but then again i think he has matured a lot uh, and i have been a huge fan of rohit sharma especially you know he plays such languid shots you you cannot imagine that such shots can come out of a cricket bat uh, he plays those shots effective effortlessly so um so he's easy on the eye and he's now also stacking up all the runs so ticking all the right boxes and uh, mm-hmm. yeah at the expense of a guy like kl rahul unfortunately um, but yeah another karnataka batsman uh, making you know uh, hay while the sun shines as they call it right mayank agarwal yeah. so he's doing well for his mm-hmm. team now indeed well he scored a double hundred so it it was also his first test hundred so he managed to convert it to a double hundred so i think uh, they were showing on the screen while the match was going on that i think he's the fourth such indian player to make his first hundred a big one mm-hmm. right and also karun nair goes on that yeah. list so karun nair made a triple hundred mm-hmm. of course but when you look at all that um, both the openers were really good so they basically made sure the run rate was always up there and also india had multiple hundred run sessions at the beginning of the game already so that meant three or four in a row meant india were always in control even though they kept losing a bit of uh, you know wickets i mean that was a bit of a worry for me because look you have two huge scores right at the top a 215 and a 176 effectively 400 runs between those two right then you have the next high score is a 30 uh, which is a bit weird i mean it doesn't uh, take anything away but a lot of 10s 20s 15s you know uh, you would expect a bit more from this 11 uh but then it's okay i guess i mean i guess i'm expecting too much because they were scoring at nearly 3.7 an over and they were able to declare quite comfortably at 502 even though they lost a session of play almost mm. right so that's well done to them when it comes to the bowling well look maharaj was doing his bit uh he was he was steady he was good at in parts yeah, but it, because it was the first day and second day it, he, he was not unplayable by any means and the pitch also did not misbehave but what uh, surprised me was you know how well the openers played out the seamers right kirish absolutely uh, so th- especially in the first innings they ensured that rabara and uh, philander did not get any wicket and when the first wicket fell mm-hmm. i think the score was 317 that's a mammoth opening partnership right so that basically set on right. the whole for the whole match and you saw what south african batsmen mm-hmm. did when they came out to bat in their first innings they lost a flurry of wickets at the top of the order i think they were three or four down three down i think for uh, 70 runs or something uh, and then uh, they start, they had to you know basically consolidate they had to ensure uh, dean elgar and uh, saf duplessis had to ensure that they didn't lose any further wickets and if if you look at what south africa did again in the second innings they again lost a lot of wickets at the top of the order so uh, so i think they had to bat intelligently and if they had done that they might have done far better than what they what the the final score sh- scorecard says but then um, indian spinners also did a very good job right i mean ashwin making a comeback to this playing 11 now after sitting out the whole uh, series uh, in west indies uh, i think he did a good job right i think mm-hmm. he picked up seven wickets um, so, so what do you think i mean right. is he back, back to his effective best do you think is he back to his uh, yeah best well yes look uh, playing at home ashwin is always a very very tough proposition for anybody right and he's been doing the rounds in county cricket he's been uh, let's say polishing up his skills very well and i think he had a point or two to prove as well to the management so to say how dare you drop me the best way to do that is to through you know do it through runs or, or rather in his case wickets because the best way is on the field as they say and uh, there are some rumors about you know not all being well between him and kohli in terms of you know a little bit of uh, clashes of ego and so on and so forth but that that really doesn't matter for any of us simply because we are more interested in what we can do for indian cricket and i would say he was really good you know you could see that uh, there were all these turning balls uh, he could take a wicket of a beautifully flighted ball like the first innings where he dismissed edel agram or in the, i think it might also be have been the first innings where he dismissed uh, philla philander i think beautiful flighted balls but there are also a lot of straighter ones right just a top spinner nothing fancy just good control over line and length and that uh, as they say the ball on a string sort of a length where you are you are able to vary this length at will and he was really really good and he completely deserved a 7 for you know 
Um, this is the contrast between somebody like, you know, Maharaj bowling 55 overs and taking only three wickets and somebody like Ashwin who's bowled 47 overs almost and still took seven wickets because the, their, you know, their economy rate wasn't very far off. But it was not just that. It's mm. how comfortable the batsman looked while playing out Elgar or Maharaj in this case versus Ashwin. So that's the whole point. And of course, let's not let's not deny the fact that the support that Ashwin had was of a slightly superior variety. So Jadeja is always a very tough proposition because he's very accurate, right? So with Jadeja holding up the other end and like not conceding much runs, it was always going to be a tough proposition for South Africa batters. At the same time, I would like to really say Dean Elgar played a wonderful innings, right? And so did Quinton de Kock. Yeah, absolutely. I think without them, the South African score would not have looked. You know, the, would not have been uh, 431 runs. And if Dean Elgar did not, uh, you know, especially that innings that he played in uh, Johannesburg, do you remember that? He took a few blows uh, against the likes of uh, Bumrah and Ishan Sharma. I think that was a vicious mm-hmm. pitch. You remember that one? It was a spitting cobra. <laughs> uh, I, I think, right. uh, if I remember right, even A.B. De Villiers broke his finger while batting out there on that pitch. And then Dean Elgar put up such a huge, uh, big fight there, uh, and he showed the same tenacity and you know the resilience of uh, withstanding the barrage of Indian spin bowling. And then he, I think, there was a good performance in the end. Uh, and without him scoring in the second innings, they were gone. South Africa lost that, uh, you know, the glue that held them together in the first innings. He was out cheaply. I think uh-huh. the second innings he was out. Uh, in fact, he was a fall off the bowling of. Uh, uh, I believe it was Jadeja again. It was LBW to Jadeja. And then after he was gone, I think there was nobody else who was right. going to play the long innings. I expected Markram could play a bit better than what he did. But yeah, he didn't stay there long enough. right? So, And you were talking about Kohli and uh, Ashwin. I think both of them are kind of polarizing characters, right? especially Kohli. Mm. So you're either on the side of Kohli or you're against Kohli. You cannot be in between. Right. It's very difficult. And it, it, as long as they make it work right. in the team, as long as they play together as a team and get the results the team wants, nobody really cares, right? So they're doing well, both of them. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Kohli will have a point or two in the upcoming tests. Ashwin has definitely made his case really well. And look, irrespective of how they do, as you say, you know, it's about the team going forward and winning. So they're doing really well in that count. Also, what I saw was that the Indian team did a very good job in the second innings. So they were already up against it a little bit because, you know, the amount of time left in the test match was probably not as much as they would have wanted. They did wonderfully well to, you know, score nearly a fine over in the second innings. And again, this year, with the pitch crumbling a little, it was already a, you know, a fourth day pitch. It was not a first day pitch. Uh, one would have expected a bit more from somebody like Dane Pete. So Dane Pete and Sedaran Muthuswami was debuting. So I would like to give him the benef- benefit of the doubt. He did decently well, you know. He took his middle wicket that of Kohli. So he'll be very happy there. But as the second spinner in the 11, Dane Peet was a bit of a disappointment. In the second innings, he's going at 6 and over. In the first innings, he's going at 5.6 and over and just one wicket. So whether he scored a 50 or not, I don't yeah. you know, see him really playing in the next test. Probably South Africa will go back to one of their seamers. But you know, this guy is the highest wicket taker in the South African domestic season, last uh, season. And for somebody like him to really not hit the strap at all was a bit surprising because... Look, we definitely know overseas spinners have come here and done well. Not to say the least, somebody like Nathan Nyack, right? Also an Aussie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that I, mm. yeah, I have one interesting tidbit. I heard this on the commentary sometime during the match. Uh, last year, South Africa A were touring India A, so they were playing in India, the A team, right? And I heard that both Dane Pete and uh, this guy Mutusami, mm. they were both part of that lineup. Right. And, not surprisingly, Mayank Agarwal played for India A. So Mayank Agarwal had played both of these two spinners uh, in that series against South Africa A. So the moment Dane Pete came out to bowl, he ensured, and as well as Muthuswami, he ensured that you know they were not allowed to settle down into a rhythm. So you have to thank Mayank Agarwal for that. Uh, Agarwal mm, mm. knew how they bowled and what their lengths were already because he played them earlier last year. So I think that made a big difference. That's what I heard. I think this was mentioned by Graham Smith, if I'm not wrong, or could have been Sean Pollock on commentary. Yeah. No, it's a very relevant yeah. point because it was not. Uh, it was only a couple of months or a couple of weeks back before the test match started. So, you know, it'd probably be very mm. 
very vivid with their minds as to how these guys are bowling. So, you know, it's, it's not a problem at all that uh, these guys would face them. Or somebody like, uh, you know, uh, Agarwal would need to face them quite a bit. Or for that matter, even, uh, you know, Markram played in that series as well. In the just the series before that, there were a couple of matches here and there. Yeah, I think that, that was a key point as well. Um, and then the other thing which kind of made news when uh, uh, Virat Kohli, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the match in the presentation ceremony, he made a remark about the ball uh, being not hard enough. Although he did admit this set of SG balls used in this test match were much harder than they were in the previous uh, series that were played in India. So he would like the ball to stay as hard as possible until about 60 overs. And with that, the batsmen are tested a bit more and the bowlers still have a chance. But you, you saw what happened. So when India were batting in the first innings or when South Africa were batting in the first innings, until the ball was really hard and was gripping, the bowlers were able to, you know, make inroads. Once the ball became so- soft, the batsmen, you know, basically settled down and then they could grind the attack and then they could accelerate at their will. So this probably is an indication that, you know, he wants test cricket to be a bit more exciting and this will it will definitely help when the bowlers are, you know, they, they, they need a bit of an advantage. I think the bowlers need to have some. Uh, there should be a bit of venom still left in the bowling attack. It should not be. It should not soften down. Indeed, a very good point. So, I think it also goes with how you maintain the ball. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you bang it in quite a lot by by throwing it from the outfield and those things also because a test match maybe not a lot. Mm-hmm. Lot of that goes on, right? But nonetheless, something for uh, the teams that play to be aware of and also how many fast bowlers you deploy or employ in the first 50-60 overs, the more it's banged into the pitch hard and hard, maybe it loses a bit of you know hardness. So, just some small things. But nonetheless, I think uh, they may have changed the, let's say, the composition of how the ball is made uh, to an extent mm-hmm. in as much that it remains harder to combat these very tough pitches that are in India, very hard pitches, right? So, yeah, maybe it also helps that uh, it helps both teams, of course, right? If the ball is hard, it also travels nicely to the boundary. So, I'm not seeing the batters complain. So, why not? <laughs> of course, of course. Which means, you know, if you... Uh, yeah, I think that the ball has been a bit of a uh, an issue which always Kohli brings up, you know. He always mm-hmm. compliments the Duke's balls, for example. He, in fact, says that Duke's balls should be used everywhere in the world. Right, uh, as it's more fav- you know, favoring the bowlers a bit more than the batsmen, uh, which brings me to the next point uh, mm-hmm. about the you know the next match being played at uh, Pune. Right, uh, right. It's it's played on the tenth of October, um, and there has only been one Test match played at Pune so far, and it was between India and Australia, and that was last year in I believe it was in February. Ah, and ah. it was a low scoring match. <laughs> 2017, Funnily right? Enough, 2017. 2017, yeah. yeah 2017, yeah. yeah, 2017. So, couple, two and a half years ago. Right. So, right. it's been a while since the test match was played at Pune. Uh-huh. And it was a low scoring match at that, the previous one. Um, and India ended up on the losing side, funnily enough. Uh, Australia won the toss, batted first. They made it some They made some 200 odd runs. Thanks to even contributions, you know, from the likes of Mitchell Stark. He made a 60-odd runs wow. uh, in that match. And then India were bowled out in the first innings for less than 110 runs with uh, Stephen O'Keefe, the left-arm spinner, picking up uh, six wickets for 35 runs in the first right. innings. And Australia made 280-odd runs um, with a lead. Of course, India had a an improbable target to chase and they were bowled out just over 100 runs. Again, Stephen O'Keefe pick, uh, picking up Six wickets for 35 runs, identical figure, although the number of overs he bowled was a bit more in the second innings. But yeah, India have lost the the only test match that has been played at Pune so far. It's going to be interesting, although you know it's it's played in a uh, different time of the year. Now it's October, almost end of monsoon, whereas um, February you can consider it winter months still here in India. So, um, so it's it's going to be interesting, especially the team composition. Uh, and I'm very happy to see Vidhiman Saha, you know, back in, you know, back in the playing squad. I forgot to mention that earlier, but I think it's a good endorsement by Kohli as right. well. Uh, oh, yeah, he's been saying he's the best keeper in mm. the world, uh, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, what is going to be the team composition? What do you think about South Africa? What changes can they bring in? Reinforcements? Look, I would expect uh, Theonis de Brown's uh, position looks a bit shaky. Somebody like uh, Zubair Hamza may come into the eleven. 
though it, it does seem a bit harsh on somebody like Tennis to Brown to lose his spot after just one test. I know he was not particularly mm-hmm. successful. Uh, so Temba Bauma may move up and Zubair Hamza may slot in after, uh, let's say, half the plus seat. Uh, Temba may go in at three or half may go in at three and Zubair Hamza would go in at five, I would expect. right? And then uh, I definitely don't see Dane Pete making the mark here. Sinaran Muthuswamy may retain his spot because of uh, how well he batted, of course. And also that he showed a bit of promise with the ball. right? So I would say um, Dane Pete would be replaced with a fast bowler and I would expect... I would expect Heinrich Norke to take the place because he has this uh, raw pace, right? And he has a bit of a bite as well, a bit of an attitude. So it might not be a bad idea to shake up the Indian batsman now and then with a word, right? Lungi Egidi is good. He's also hit the deck bowler. Uh, so is Heinrich Norke. So one of those two will come, but my bet is on Heinrich Norke making a debut ahead of Lungi Egidi playing the test. Uh, and this would be South Africa's 11. Uh, what about you? Do you see any other changes? Uh, I think I agree with you on that. Uh, although I would like to see Lungi Ngidi because of his height. I think he's taller than uh, the other guys. So with uh, him, Philander, Philander is not so tall, but uh, Rabara and Ngidi, they are both quite tall and Ngidi really hits the deck hard, like you said. And if it's a bit of a bouncy track, if it's a greenish pitch at Pune, then uh, he can exploit uh, you mm. know, the, the sea movement quite a lot. So, yeah. But, but India, I don't know. I mean, I, in Indian team, I don't see them making any changes. Uh, for me, what do, what do you think? No, I definitely agree. Look, especially with Swami bowling so well and him being so effective in the second innings, right? Uh, I would say they would retain that bite with the older ball that Shami can give you, right? So Shami would definitely play. And Ishan Sharma is your holding fast bowler and it depends on the pitch, really. I mean, if anybody, I don't see any changes to the batting lineup and Saha was tidy behind the wicket as well. You know, he would have liked a bit more runs in front of the wicket, I'm sure, but he was very tidy. I think he may have dropped a catch or two, some tough catches there. But uh, apart from that, um, I really don't see any other change. Either India will go with the same 11 or they may replace Ishan Sharma with another spinner. I know, dan, 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 it's a very serious pronouncement to make. Depending on how the pitch looks, uh-huh. they might as well do it. That, you know, Kuldeep Yadav may come into the 11 in place of Ishan Sharma. That's going to be, you know, a left field choice, but it might still happen. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Interesting, very interesting. Who, which other seamer do, we, uh, do India have? Well, they have Umesh Yadav in the squad. Ishan Sharma may lose his place for a spinner. So that means three spinners in one field. Right? So if it's the sort of a pitch or sort of a, let's say, a pitch that was on Pune last time, where a left arm variety spinner was very successful, and uh, India may actually go in with three spinners. But I, I don't see that change happening. That's a bit too much. Mm-hmm. Kohli always likes the cushion of having two faster bowlers. He's said this multiple times and also done this multiple times, whether he's playing in India or abroad. So I would say, yeah, yeah it'll be two fast yeah. bowlers. India has two more, uh, you know, uh, well-established spinners yeah. in their squad, right? So apart from Ashwin and Jadeja, they have uh, Hanuma Vihari and they have Rohit Sharma, who both rolled their arm over in this match. So why not? Well, <laughs> Vihari more, uh, Rohit Sharma, I think it might have been a bit of fun. But yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I... It's not the same, you know, the control over lengths and lengths is definitely not the same when it comes to a part-time Vihari. Yeah, I think Kohli wanted Rohit Sharma, uh, you know, to have a bit more of a, uh, an interesting debut. He wanted right. Rohit Sharma also to pick up a wicket in his, de- in his debut as an opener, I guess. So. Right, right. Well, not a bad idea. A- anyway, in the end, he was man of the match, right? So yes, yes, yes. So, look, that move has paid off and um, my parts of this Indian team are clicking together nicely with the start of an Indian cricket season home season, you know. So, that's a good thing yeah. for them, right? Mm. Now, uh, if you were to move on, and uh, there was this, there is this other international cricket series going on between Pakistan and Sri Lanka, right? So, Pakistan, you know, finally cricket started. The first uh, one day in Karachi was a washout. But then, the second and the third, Pakistan won comfortably, right? So, <clears throat> first time back at home, Babar Azam was able to score 100 and Shinwari took a fifer. I think Shinwari had a point to prove he was a bit angry they left him out of the World Cup squad. So I think both of these people did really well. So they won the match for Pakistan there. And you no, know, it was a high scoring encounter. They made 305. But then, you know, even though Sri Lanka were all out for just 238, they had some balls left. So they had a real big collapse right at the top. Otherwise, things could have been very interesting there, right? That's one thing. And the second one there, again, Pakistan won comfortably. This time, Sri Lanka batted first and set them a very tough chase. In fact, this was a record chase as far as Pakistan is concerned because 
this was their first chase of more than 275 like last three years i read so they were able to chase down 297 set by sri lanka they made 299 for five again a lot of very good contributions right down the top order and their openers did really well even though you know um imam uh, who's well, imam ul haq who's a regular opener was injured for the second odi right he injured his hand in the first, second odi and third odi he was not able to play abid ali who came in made a 70 and fakhar zaman made 76 so they gave them a good start and then the rest of the middle order took over and they finished the top so you know that that was nicely done as far as pakistan is concerned they took the odi series 2-0 mm-hmm. and but they've gotten a bit of a reverse because they have lost both the t20s that have followed so this young sri lankan side has come up trumps so the first t20 right so that was uh, again a very thorough performance as far as sri lanka was concerned because they were able to you know make a 175 run uh, score and then they were able to restrict pakistan to just 100 so sorry 165 score and then they were able to restrict pakistan to 100 so that was a very very consummate win as far as uh, you know a t20 goes there were really no batting performances whatsoever sarfraz ahmed is beginning to show a bit of form he made 24 in the first t20 and then again 26 i think in today's t20 but both the matches pakistan lost and that's not really good as far as they are concerned right because um they have lost now the T20 series. They they have won the one day series, but they have lost the T20 series to Sri Lanka, right? And mm-hmm. this is a Sri Lanka. Let's not forget that it has like seven or eight missing people from regular eleven. So they have done really well there. So, but the good part is that cricket is back in Pakistan. You could see that the grounds were really nice, and there were a lot of people in the ground, a lot of enthusiasm shown. One thing we did here is that some of the matches in Karachi, the two matches that happened in Karachi, in fact, did not have the stadiums full. That was a bit surprising, but I can imagine, you know, with all the rain, maybe people chose to stay away, that they were not, they were a bit afraid and so on. Right? But uh, that was a very nice series. Uh, and there is a remaining uh, T20I, which is again going to be in Lahore. So let's look forward to how that goes, whether, you know, Pakistan can come back because they have a few things they need to sort out. The fast bowling in terms of, you know, Muhammad Amir is a bit up and down and their middle order is not looking as well as it could. Umar Akbal making a comeback was out for a duck in both the matches. First ball ducks, in fact. Ahmad Shahzad really did not light the world on fire. So in this match, he played at number three. Uh, that is, in the second uh, T20, he played at number three. But in the first T20, he had opened mm-hmm. and all of these things. So they have a few things to sort out. So maybe they are keen because they are the number one ranked T20 team in the world, of course. And uh, there is a T20 World Cup coming up in the next year. So this is going to be something that they will want to sort out as soon as possible. Right? Yeah. And the other thing I read or heard somewhere uh, was that Nisba wanted to give all these players a longer run. He didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, drop players, you know, to, uh, as they call it, chop. Yeah, I don't know what it's called. There's a phrase I forgot. Damn. Chop and Man. change. You mean. Chop and change. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Right. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, he doesn't want to do that. He wants to give all these players a longer run. And he's, of course, worried about surprises form, but he, he thinks that he will come back to form soon enough so he wants to you know have his faith in his players he show he wants to show faith in players and uh, let them you know perform uh, with uh, no pressure on them so i think that's a good the good point because i think if umar akmal has made it made it back to the squad it's uh, he should be given a long run he's a mm-hmm. fantastic player uh, right. he's also mercurial we all know that but uh, mm-hmm. let's hope it goes well for pakistan and uh, uh, yeah very happy to see that international cricket is being played again so, wonderful, wonderful news for uh, cricket in general. Indeed. Well, if you were to quickly look at some of the other T20 series that are ongoing, right? So, the India women versus South Africa women T20s concluded recently. So, there was one hastily arranged additional T20 played because two got washed out. So, it became uh, effectively a four-match series that India won 3-1. So, India had won the first five out of the first five uh, matches. Three were played and India won those to make it 3-0 but the sixth one South, South Africa came back and won a, in a big 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 victory you know they won by 105 runs right this is the greatest loss for the Indian women's team in T20 I take it as far as you know it became a bit of a problem I think but finally you know I think the team was doing really well and they had a sort of a dead rubber probably you know dead rubber uh, sort of a feeling when they lost that also in the third uh, T20 between uh, Australia women and Sri Lanka women Alisa Healy went bonkers. She made 148 and uh, that helped, you know, Australia win really, really big. That was completely, um, you know, it was one of those real, you know, if you remember Brendan McCullum's innings against uh, Bangalore back in the first season of, uh, yeah. you know, IPL. I, I, I sort of remembered that innings, but I was looking through the highlights of this. 
So she made 148 of just 61 balls. She hit seven sixes and 19 fours. So it was a fantastic, fantastic innings. And they made 226. And even though Sri Lanka really, really fought, they could only, they could really not match up with that because they were only able to make 94 for seven in their 30 overs. So that was a huge, huge defeat because that was a win by 132 runs. So that's a rare thing that happens. So these are some other T20Is that are happening. So there's also the Oman Pentangular that is happening where, you know, just to focus on Netherlands because we both live here. So Netherlands, unfortunately, has had a couple of bad matches. So on fourth, they lost to Ireland. And on uh, and today on the seventh, they lost to Nepal. So back-to-back losses. But I hope they're able to pick themselves up, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a very nice initiative that, you know, five countries are able to play T20Is. In fact, they have two matches each day, just almost like an IPL, right? So that's very nice. And... Uh, Oman and Hong Kong are really, really competing well. So that's also nice to see along with Nepal. Ireland, you would expect now they are a full, you know, fully accepted uh, team with test match status and everything. They're able to do well. But, uh, you know, the other associate nations can take heart. The other thing is every T20 that is played, so ICC has sanctioned that every T20 played between any member nation is an international. So all of these matches are international. So it's also really good that these people are able to get this experience, the other countries. And uh, that's the only way they'll grow. So ICC is slowly opening the doors and we really hope this change also comes to the other formats, maybe not to tests right away, but at least to ODIs, you know, so that more people and more countries are able to participate. I have a question. The, does, uh, when ICC declares these matches as B20 internationals, does it also have a financial consequence, do you think? I think so. I think so. I mean, look, um, maybe it has a financial consequence as far as the players are concerned with their payment from the match fee and so on. I think that would be good. I mean, there is no fixed match fee as far as I'm concerned. But but the moment it becomes an international, it's a matter of prestige. So I'm assuming the boards pay better. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, yes. Indeed, right? And more people that can earn a living from cricket, the more serious it will be. And, you know, the more they're able to grow the cricket in each of those countries. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, man. Good point. So going further... Uh, you know, we spoke about Belagavi Panthers, the team whose owner was sort of being uh, investigated by the police back in India. Uh, it looks like the team has been suspended. So this is a team which is a part of Karnataka Premier League in India. And uh, because the owner is under investigation, it looks like this guy also owns another team in the Dubai T10 leagues, right? So probably, you know, it doesn't board well that somebody like this is cooperating or was caught uh, talking with the bookies. So it doesn't look really good. So, it means this investigation will have to go in a bit deeper. So, as a result, I think uh, the incoming uh, KSA, uh, yeah. you know, chairman-elect, uh, Roger Binney, uh, him and his team, they have decided that they'll be suspending this team. So, uh, let's really hope this guy or this owner gets punished, but the team really doesn't suffer because of that. We've seen this happen with IPL previously. So, we are really hoping, you know, it doesn't become another fiasco like that today. Yeah, absolutely not. We don't want to see another CSK and... Uh... Rajasthan Royals being suspended. We don't want to see that again. Indeed. Indeed. Right. Going further, some more shenanigans from BCCI. So, the ombudsman, Mr. D.K. Jain, Justice D.K. Jain, right, he sent more uh, conflict of interest notices. So, the three people who are a part of the CAC, so, Anshuman Gaikwad, Kapil Dev, and Shantaranga Swami, all three of them have quit within days of each other from the CAC. So, this is a bit extreme because, you know, it's a bit weird that all of them are getting uh, no conflict notices and uh, it's conflict of interest notices. It's a bit weird, don't you think? Well, it, it is getting a bit weird now because uh, the occurrences of such you know people getting conflict of interest notices has increased over a period of time. <laughs> Almost everybody gets one of these now. If you're involved in cricket administration, you get one. I think it's it's kind of a qualification now. You need to have a conflict of interest notice. Otherwise, you're not fit to you know uh, decorate that position. Now, jokes apart, I think it's uh, uh, this must have hurt the ego of such uh, you know players of such high esteem like uh, Anshuman Gaikwad and Kapil Dev and also Shantar Rangaswamy. So they probably don't want to be part of it anymore. Uh, but I, I don't know what the decisions were about and how they were how they arrived at these decisions. But yeah, they yeah I don't know. I mean they they're probably following law to the letter. Uh, that's why they have to issue such notices. Apart from that, I don't know what's actually happening over there. Look, there is spirit of law and there is letter of the law and they are two separate things. I don't want to go into it here. But probably they have a point, you know. We should probably consult one of our previous guests who was also a lawyer. So, mm. Hello. yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? uh, so maybe they can give us a better opinion here. 
So at the end of the day, what I heard was at least in Chantaranga Swami's case, there was no clear conflict. In spite of that, she, was, she got a conflict of interest notice. And one way or the other, you know, it's a good thing that accountability is being brought, uh, you know, but it, it seems a bit pedantic to me. But it's fine. Look, there is the CAC, which sort of did its job because their one of their jobs was to choose the Indian men's coach, which have, they have done, right? And the next things we'll have to see whether, when and what the CAC is... Uh, responsibility would be and whether after the upcoming elections of BCCI, the mm-hmm. elections that will be foreseen by the um, you know, the board appointed the COA, uh, those that committee. So we'll have to see what happens after that and maybe a new CAC will be constituted and so on and so forth. No, but it might not be a very bad thing, just a very heavy-handed way of handling these things, that's all. A new CSA, CAC to appoint another coach? Do, do you think yeah, they chose the Indian that. coach? <laughs> well, I think they did. I think they did. Yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah. So okay. they did. I mean, there was sure they did. their opinion was considered, is what I would like to say. And I think I won't like to cast aspersions on these people simply because they did their job. Because I remember there was also some talk about who should consult whom, Kohli consulting Kapil Dev or Kapil Dev consulting Kohli or whatever. So I, from what I got to know when we read all that is they didn't get to consult or they didn't want to consult Kohli. So that meant they made a, an independent decision. And that in itself for me is okay. Okay. Yeah, you can take their word for it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, if the, if there was no, look, there will be a bit of, there'll be a recommendation for sure, a public one and a private one and so on. But at the end of the day, they made the decision. And uh, well, as far as the results are getting delivered and uh, Ravi Shastri is like a big uncle, grand uncle, right? Yeah. A little crazy, crazy little drunk uncle. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't say that. No, no, no. no, no. Especially with that meme doing rounds on social media. <laughs> Isn't it the one where uh, Dravid and uh, Shastri yeah. in picture? <laughs> right. Yeah. Named, uh, yeah, two movies in one picture. Two right. in Hindi, Hindi movies, basically. Uh, those are Amitabh Bachchan in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, That can happen. Well, that was a good one. Uh, well, moving forward, Chris Silverwood has finally been named as the England men's head coach. And he's taken over from Trevor Bellis and for all formats. So, he's a bit of time to get his, uh, you know, as they say, feet under the table before the New Zealand tour comes around. And uh, he's 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 no let's say he's no uh, <clears throat> stranger to the England setup. Wasn't he the bowling coach? Wasn't he the bowling coach under uh, Bailey? Exactly. Yeah? Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's the yes, well spotted. So he's no stranger to the England England setup. He's been with this team already previously, at least once at least previously as well. So and I think he has a lot of good credentials, and um, I hope he does really good with the England cricket team. It's also a local, again, it's a local somebody from England setup, so he probably understands the setup also mm. uh, slightly that much better. He's played. He's also, he had a very short international career. I think he was very injured, injury prone, and he was a fast bowler, if I remember right. But, uh, you know, let's see how that goes going forward for him. So, good luck to him. Mm. So, now, let's, if we go on to the trivia section, uh, last time's trivia uh, questions were a bit, you know, muddled up because uh, the trivia question from episode 62 I had retained, I had not answered it because some people had still some queries so i'll just reveal the answer quickly and then go on to the trivia question from the last episode so the trivia question from episode 62 was uh, if you look at the number of tests a country took to achieve its first 100 first test match 100 how many was the highest number of matches taken and which country took it so the answer was actually south africa which got its made in test 100 in its eighth match right so Yogesh, after a few back and forth, got the answer right. Apart from that, I didn't get any um, correct answers, even though a couple of people wrote into us asking a bit more clarity about the question. So I think we need to be a bit careful while giving the question, uh, or we have to make sure it's framed the uh, correct way, right, Kiri? Yeah. The next one, <clears throat> so was which bowler has taken the most number of wickets in the India South Africa test so far? This is the uh, trivia question from the previous episode. This one again, Yogesh has got it right. The answer is Anil Kumble, who took 84 wickets. So, as usual, Yogesh has sent in a lot of very nice trivia along with the uh, answer. So, very nice. So, it's very nice to see somebody going into that level of depth. And also, I hope our other listeners who are equally keen can do this. So, it's always very nice to us when we get these detailed, detailed answers. So, the trivia question for this episode is. Now it's a very easy one if you've been following all the latest uh, you know, the news. So, who is the only Indian to be out stumped twice in a test? So, it happened recently. So, that's the clue I can give you. But, you know, it's never happened apparently in so many, so many, you know, 500 or 600 tests that India have played that nobody's actually been stumped twice. 
So, uh, you know, this is the question that is India-centric, but I would be very curious to check how many times it's actually happened in test cricket that batsmen were actually out stumped twice in a test. Mm. So I'll look into it by the next episode, but if any of our listeners are able to get in touch with us, not only with respect to the answer, but also with respect to these things, it would be very good to you know, discuss this in the upcoming episode. So you could get in touch with us, you know, to answer our question or, you know, let us know your thoughts and comments, you know, uh, via social media, for example, Twitter at Armchair Cricket Pod, or also via our Facebook page, or you could write into us at armchair.cricket at gmail.com, right? It'll be very nice if those of you who listen to our podcast also leave us a five-star ratings on any platform you, you know, lose, you use to listen to the episodes, especially like Apple iTunes and Podbean. They give us some very good you know, feeling and also it helps us, right? So there are there's plenty of test matches coming up. For example, India plays, and you know the the summer of the southern hemisphere is going to start very soon. England is going to tour New Zealand, and a lot of other international cricket ongoing. So I'm sure we have a lot to discuss. So I hope you all stay tuned. Right. Having said all that, it's a goodbye from me, and it's a goodbye from him. Bye bye. <laughs>